Hello, everyone. I am Rahul Gosain. And I'm Roy Gosain. And we are the Oncology Brothers. In the year 2023, Nature Medicine recognized 10 key influential individuals for advancing the science. That list includes one of the ChatGPT co-founder, another being an engineer who played a pivotal role in moon landing for India, and also a medical oncologist, Dr. Todd Powell's whose work has led to the doubling of the overall survival benefit for our bladder cancer patients. And today we're here to take a deeper dive in that study, EV302. Tom, thank you so much for joining us. That's quite an introduction. Um, I, you know, I really is. Uh, to be involved in the moon landing would have been cool, I've got to say. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't even, I don't even know how to work chat PT, so... Uh, um, but I'm, I'm told that's uh, amazing. So, yeah, I was very lucky to be part of that group. Uh, it's a huge team effort, tens, like, literally tens of thousands of people. And I just happened to be the person talking about it. And there would have been uh, a lot of other people who would have been equally uh, equally justified in that task. So uh, I represent a huge group of people. Um, and I, I'm very lucky to be involved. Absolutely. Wow, Tom. Congratulations. This is no less than any other moon landing either. We are, and you're saving patients' lives and making it much longer, which is the key on why we are in oncology today. Tom, if he was approved as a single agent in 2019 in relapsed refractory settings for bladder cancer. And then phase two study EV103 cohort K showed promising data for cis and ineligible patients. But EV302 study was mainly for all comers. Here we have the study design, and if you don't mind going over the study design with us today. Yeah, it's relatively straightforward. So you're absolutely right. In Fortumabidotin, as a single agent in heavily pretreated patients, has a 40% response rate. When you combine it with pembrolizumab in the frontline setting in a single arm trial, that response rate goes up to about 70%. Um, chemotherapy, historically, response rates of about 45%. So we were quietly confident we could beat chemotherapy. Um, but we weren't um, we weren't confident we would get the results we did, which I'll talk about in a second. So this is a frontline randomized trial. It's an all-comer population: gem cis, gem carbo, um, you know, PDL one positive, negative, and all comers. Um, um, actually, varied histology as well. Um, so it's, uh, it's it's a big study: one hundred and eighty patients because uh, of a dual primary endpoint of PFS and OS, uh, and uh, EV pembro until progression. Uh, chemotherapy, six cycles, um, and then maintenance of Valumab allowed. 31% of patients had maintenance of Valumab, which is you know, probably in the real world about the same number. Maybe in a trial it should be slightly higher, but I don't think that's massively influential in the results. Tom, thank you for covering that. You brought up that 31% of the patients got maintenance of Valumab. To be honest, if the results were similar, we would have honed into that a little more saying, oh my God, what's the cross-trial comparison here? But clearly there is a significant synergy that we're seeing with this antibody drug conjugate and immunotherapy. And these results are phenomenal. What did this study show? What are the findings of EV303? So, um, you know, um, synergy is a word that, it, it's, it's a complicated word. And I think in pre clinical terms, you know, it's one plus one equals three. Um, and, and, and we've never really, shown, I mean, maybe in testis cancer, but the way I look at synergy in a clinical perspective is to have you know, results much better than you're getting with either of the single agent drugs um, without, the, without apparent cross resistance. So I think one plus one equals 2.1 or 2.2. That's probably good enough for me. To sit, yeah. And it's a word, the other word we don't like using, which is also being used for this trial is cure. Uh, you know, we had a, a 30% or 29% CR rate. We've never really seen anything like that in urothelial cancer before. But I think that's why some people you know, are using these very, um, uh, these very high bar terms. Um, look, the results were better than I thought. Um, I, I had, you know, I, I had dreams before the trial that I, had, I do it quite a lot. I, I should get out more. But, you know, <laughs> you know, um, but I would have bought 0 0.71, 0 0.75 would have been, you know. Um, but here we got results of PFS of 0 
all five uh, hazard ratio uh, and OS 0 0.47. So a more than a 50% reduction in the risk of progression or death. Um, we also showed, uh, I mean, the, the control arm performed well. It performed very much in line with what you'd expect for a mixed gem cis, gem carbo population. In fact, it performed better than we've seen for most of the previous control arms of the trials I've done. Maintenance of Valimab may have had a role to play in some of that. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that if you look at the OS curve, the tail of the curve looks a bit immature at the moment. And, um, and, and I think when that does mature, we're going to see median survivals in the region of about three years. Uh, and that, you know, when we started doing these trials, when we started doing this study, you know, median OS between 12 and 14 months. And so that bar's now been moved close to three years. And, and that is a big difference. Um, and it's, um, and I think that is transformative. And obviously we've not seen that with the chemotherapy, Gemsys, Gem Carbo immune therapy trials. We've not seen those sorts of results with maintenance of Valimab. With Valimab, you've got to get through that chemotherapy period. And that's quite challenging. Many patients don't get through there. And the durability of the immune responses, while they're good, many patients don't respond to single agent immune therapy. And that's part of where that sort of synergy conversation comes in. Well, this is impressive to say the least, as, as you stated, transformative. Tom, again, congratulations. You rightly received the standing ovation, definitely well-deserved. And I think the dates to receive the standing ovation. Yes. <laughs> that's fair. That is fair. No, thanks to certainly our patients and their families and everyone involved in this trial. So now this is approved here in the U.S. already as a new standard of care. But is there any particular patient that you would not consider this as a first line treatment option? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the field is transforming. And that's why I use transformative, because we've been using cisplatin eligibility for gem cis and gem carbo for a generation. And we've also more recently been using platinum eligibility to say, well, then you can't have platinum. And if you can't have platinum, you can get single agent Pembro. And quite a lot of patients were getting single agent Pembro because platinum is pretty hard to give and it has, doesn't have great results. And some people, some friends of mine say gem carbo, you know, it's a bit of a waste of time. PFS four and a half, five months, OS nine months. And most of that time's on toxic chemotherapy. This is very different from that. And my clinical, my personal experience, we'll talk about toxicity in a second, is that you can give and you're putting patients into quite durable remissions. And some of those patients are not, don't continue on EB Pembro. Some of those patients can stop some of the therapies and, and you can and reduce or change the drugs around. So it's a very different clinical phenotype, these, these treated patients. Um, I don't think there are any patients who I would want to give gem cis or gem carbo to. You know, if you've got uncontrolled diabetes, well, you wouldn't want to give chemotherapy to an uncontrolled diabetic. You want to control their diabetes. The same with EV Pembro. There are some contraindications to immune checkpoint inhibition. Absolute. You know, if you, uh, I don't know, you're on immunosuppressive drugs for a transplant, although some, I don't, I don't give those patients immune therapy. You might say they're better off with cisplatin. I'm happy to have that discussion. Some friends of mine disagree with me on that issue active autoimmune disease requiring immune suppression. Um, if you had a really bad skin re re lesion, but you know, if you've got psoriasis, you might say well, that's an immune therapy problem. I don't think there are skin rashes as such which currently overlap with this skin rash. And I don't think that having existing skin rash never necessarily predisposes to a skin rash associated with this combination. So I, I, I sort of look at it and say, no, I, I don't think there is. And actually I think the pie gets a bit bigger of patients. And the reason why that's the case is even myself, every now and then I see a patient and say, you know, you're a bit borderline, platinum-based chemotherapy is not that great. Um, you might be better off just having Pembro or having nothing, honestly. And you have a conversation with a family and you talk through it. Whereas here, when you talk about, well, you know, there's a 30% chance of CR and there's this issue around durable remission that we didn't see before. I think more people say, actually, I want to have a go. Uh, and so... I think the pool gets bigger. Then the next question, which I suspect you're going to ask me, is, well, what about toxicity and how do we make, how do we give this as safely as we possibly can? Yeah, actually, let's take that uh, as a good segue. Let's talk about toxicity because, yes, it's approved, but in the community, not only approval, I need to get very comfortable in managing this. Skin toxicities, neuropathy, hyperglycemia from infortumab. You've mentioned immune-related toxicities from pembrolizumab. So 
Can you share some clinical pearls in managing some of these toxicities? Are you going to skip day eight, dose reduce? What is it looking like in your clinic today? Thank you. This is the most important issue for me because we can actually, we can pretty much everyone agrees this is a transformative regime. Um, and, um, and the question then comes not about should we give this regime or that regime, is how do we give this regime most effectively? How do we give this regime most safely? And that I think has to be, and that's, I'm, I'm flying around the world trying to describe that at the moment with friends and colleagues. Because um, the adverse event profile here you can see is, is, is higher for chemotherapy, the grade three or four adverse events at 70%, but that's high. Now, that's very high. And that underlines how difficult chemotherapy has been, has been. And that comes back to that patient who I talked to Jem Carbo about with a performance status of two, who's not feeling great, who decides not to have it. Because when you talk through chemotherapy, some patients just say it's not for me. So actually saying it's better than chemotherapy, which it might be, is not actually the solution to our issue. Our issue is what toxicity can we expect? Have we been trained in this type of toxicity? And how do we manage this safely? And the reality is we haven't been trained in the adverse events associated with all of the antibody drug conjugates. And this drug, unlike chemotherapy, which has got the nausea, the fatigue, the kidney function, dysfunction, the um, neutropenic sepsis, the bleeding, all of those, it doesn't have any of those things actually. What it does is two or three key adverse events that require education and training. The first is a skin rash. It can cause a skin rash in the first three or four cycles. If you get a skin rash in the first three or four cycles, stop the drug, even if it's a mild rash. Because what happens is the skin rash can escalate with time. And if you interrupt the drug and you let the skin rash settle and you bring the dose down one level, what you'll find is the skin rash probably doesn't come back. Huh. And under those circumstances, you can treat these patients safely. What we did, and I can tell you I've made every mistake you can imagine in life and in oncology. And you know what we did in, in this is we actually, I saw one of our first three or four patients, single agent EV, not the combination, but single agent EV, we treated you know, day one, eight, 15. We gave day 15 on cycle two of a patient with a grade one rash and they came back and their skin was blistering and it was difficult. So when you see rash, particularly in the first three or four cycles, dose interrupt, close observation, re-challenge when back to normal at a lower dose. What you'll find is the drug is very active. You don't need to worry about pouring more and more drug in. I think we feel under pressure to give the drug because it's working. And I don't think that's the right advice. My advice to people is don't pour in more and more drug. Actually, the drug's really active. Take your foot off the accelerator when you've got toxicity. Put your foot on the brake because that will stop permanent discontinuation. So that's the first thing. The second one is peripheral neuropathy. It's actually a motor and a sensory neuropathy. We're used to just sensory neuropathy with platinum. This can be some coordination as well if you let it get too serious. And again, it tends to accumulate between cycle six and cycle 12, in my experience. And if you dose interrupt on grade one tox, you give three or four weeks off, you bring down one dose, you'll actually find you can keep going for much longer with that. And then there are other disease is transaminitis. It does, it's not associated with very much interstitial lung disease. Um, but it is, and the, and the rest of the adverse events actually quite similar to what you'd expect with immune checkpoint inhibition, or dare I say it, chemotherapy. You know, there's some nausea, there is a little bit of alopecia and other bits and pieces, as you can see. Tom, thank you so much for going over with that. Though EV Pembro, as we can see, and as you stated, is certainly better tolerated than chemo, but as a community oncologist, we definitely need to get more familiarized with these side effects because impact is on quality of life. Tom, number of these patients, about 30%, as you stated earlier, had a complete response with this regimen, which is remarkable in stage four setting. Now, with this hot topic of ctDNA, outside of clinical trials, would you be utilizing or are you utilizing this to avoid overtreatment or thoughts when you might want to stop in Fortumab at all? Yeah, so circulating tumor DNA is being used in the United States now. I think in urethelial cancer, it's currently um, continues to be an experimental tool. Um, there is a study post adjuvant setting uh, called Invigor 11, which is randomizing patients after a cystectomy who are ctDNA positive, just the positive population, 
to 40% of the positive to a tezolizumab or placebo. And that's a really important study. I think in the adjuvant setting, we're treating too many patients who don't need therapy. We know the relapse rate is only about 40 to 50%. That means we're putting half of the patients potentially in harm's way who don't need it. In the future, we will be selecting these patients. It's not fair on those patients who don't need adjuvant therapy to put them through a year of potentially 10% chance of life-changing toxicity. So in the adjuvant setting, CTDNA has got a really important role to play. In this setting, where we're monitoring disease progress, I'm not sure CTDNA has such a big role to play. I think we're going to see some data in the not-too-distant future in advanced disease at CTDNA clearance rates and what that means. And I think that that clearance may actually end up being more predictive than radiology response. And I'd be excited about that. I think that moving away from radiology response, I think radiology will always have a role to say, where is the disease? Are there local therapies required? Is there radiotherapy saver? But once you know what you're doing, I'm not sure regular CT scans are that helpful. In the academic community, we are a measure by resist 1.1. It's quite complicated. Um, I don't love it, to be honest. And I think that in the community, I'm sure we're just getting radiology reports saying that it's a bit better. I'm not sure that's as helpful as it could be. And I think we're going to develop more accurate tools in the future. But I think that's five or 10 years. Away. I don't think it's just here today or tomorrow. So I wouldn't be using CTDNA. But those patients that have had a complete response to therapy, once they get to the two-year mark, that two-year pembrolizumab mark, which is stopped, there is a question about whether they need to continue on EV. And actually, some of those patients may be stopping EV earlier for adverse events. I think it's going to be really exciting to look at those complete responders to see if they continue on EV. My personal experience is we've managed to stop the, pe the drug in many of those patients who have done really well, and they continue to do well. So it doesn't, I don't think it is a drug which you have to be giving to maintain that response. And I think it's changing the disease. I think it's pushing patients into durable remission. I think it's hitting the cancer really hard at the start. And that's allowing us for those patients to get some of their quality of life back as well. The treatment algorithm for bladder cancer has not changed because of EV302 study and our patients are living longer with this disease. Tom, congratulations, and thank you for taking the time to cover this data with us today. For our listeners, stay tuned for a quick recap. On December 15, 2023, and Fortimabitotin and Pembrolizumab as a combination was approved in first line for advanced or metastatic bladder cancer based off of EV302 study. In this discussion, we got a chance to focus on the study with Dr. Tom Powells, who led this effort. When compared to chemotherapy, and Fortumab resulted in significant improvement in overall survival benefit with median survival of 31.5 months versus 16.1 months with chemotherapy. It is important to keep side effects of Infortumab and antibody drug conjugate in mind, as this is now our standard of care in frontline for metastatic bladder cancer patients. Make sure to check out our bladder cancer algorithm discussion with Dr. Kareen Tawaji and Dr. Sia Danishman, where we get a chance to put all our treatment options in context. Thanks for joining us. We are the Oncology Brothers.